Welcome to Episode 7 of Quiltside Chats. Brought to you by American Quilt Study Group. The American Quilt Study Group establishes and promotes the highest standards for interdisciplinary quilt-related studies, providing opportunities for study, research, and the publication of works that advance the knowledge of quilts and related subjects. In partnership with the International Quilt Museum at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, the International Quilt Museum's mission is to build a global collection and audience that celebrate the cultural and artistic significance of quilts. And sponsored by Quilt Folk, a quarterly keepsake magazine of, by, and for quilters. Quiltside Chats are a series of lively conversations between Carolyn Ducey, International Quilt Museum Curator of Collections, and an American Quilt Study Group member featuring the quilt that she or he would sneak out of the building if it weren't a crime. Tara Miller is a quilt designer, maker, enthusiast, and rookie historian. By day, she's a user experience content developer in the software industry, but most other waking moments are all about quilts. She serves on the board of directors of the American Quilt Study Group. Her patterns and articles have been published in Quilt Mania, Simply Modern, Simply Vintage, and Modern by the Yard. She produces The Six Know-It-Alls, a monthly series where some illustrious historians dive into quilt history and she also hosts and produces her own shows on her YouTube channel. In Quilt District on the Road, she brings viewers inside special visits to museums. In Quilt District Goes Under the Quilt, she brings interviews and backstories. In an upcoming episode, an interview with Jonathan Holstein. Carolyn Ducey is Curator of Collections at the International Quilt Museum, a position she has held since 1998. She oversees acquisition and management of the IQM collection of more than 8,500 quilts. Ducey earned an MA in American Art History from Indiana University in 1998 and her PhD in textiles, clothing, and design with an emphasis in quilt studies at the University of Nebraska in 2010. She is co-editor of American Quilts in the Industrial Age, 1760 to 1870, published in 2018, and a co-author of What's in a Name, Inscribed Quilts, published in 2012. And now, let's cozy up to the quilt. Hi, everybody. Hi, welcome. Hi, Tara. This is such a great way to spend a chilly afternoon, and I think a lot of us are having a very chilly afternoon today. So it's nice to be here with you. I am so excited to talk about Jean Ray Laurie. I can't hear you, Tara. I think you're still muted. Hopefully um, everybody's there. Here we go. There you are. Hey. Yes. Welcome, welcome. Hey. So yeah, you you are getting some very unusual snow in your neighborhood, aren't you? We are. We are. We're. I'm in Atlanta, and we. It's actually sticking to the ground, and that's not typical for us. So we'll see how that goes. Yeah. <laughs> I think yesterday the grocery store was sold out of everything. Yeah, that happens always. If there's a storm coming, there's a run at the grocery store. Oh, absolutely. So we have a couple comments from Hildegard saying that our sound is kind of going on and off. Um, I don't know how much, Tara, you're going to be able to troubleshoot. You're usually our, our go-to person behind the scene, and today you're our, our, um, we're going to be chatting. So, um, Hildegard, we're going to just, maybe should we just keep going forward, Tara, and see if other people are having an issue with their sound. If they'd let us know, that'd yeah. be great. Yeah, because it, it may just be her connection, but uh, with these this weather here, it could be mine too. So yeah. I hope that's not the case. Yeah, with the but, snow. Um, I hope we don't lose you. Oh my gosh. Yeah, I hope so too. Yeah. Because we have some amazing things to look at oh from gosh. Ray Laurie today. Well, I have to tell you my favorite, well, my favorite Jean Ray story. It, it's like the most amazing story. It's one of my absolute favorite things about um, my whole experience as a curator here at the museum was this opportunity I had to get to meet Jean and um, her daughter when we acquired a number of her pieces. And um, 
I, on a Monday morning, I'll never forget it. I came in, answered the call, and it was a representative for um, rep, um, for Jean saying, I just wanted to talk to you. Jean wanted me to have this conversation with you, so there was no pressure. But we're just wondering if you might be interested in Jean's collection. We have, like, retrospective of her quilts. We have all of her papers, her teaching materials. But here's the kicker. There's one thing you have to do. And I was like, oh, I mean, I'm like, like my heart is just pounding at this. I'm like, okay, okay, whatever, whatever. I said, you have to take this wooden cart. So at one of Jean's birthdays, a friend had all of these people make these tiny little quilts as birthday cards. And then she delivered them in a painted cart. And they were, Jean was so worried that we weren't going to want that cart <laughs> that we wouldn't take her collection. And I could barely get the words out how much I wanted that collection. I said, I don't care who we have to go through. Yes, there are steps I have to take, but I'm telling you right now, we will take any of it. We will take all of it. And it was an absolute thrill because subsequently then my sister and I, who is the archivist here on campus, went out to Jean's and packed up her quilt and her archives. So we have the most amazing collection. And, and and I got to spend time with her in her home. And honestly, it was just like, after just being around that beautiful, funny, positive spirit, you just were inspired. It was a really magical visit for me. It was so cool. So I'm so excited to be able to talk to, about her yeah. and about her quilts. So I'm so sad I came along into the quilt world after she had left us because I, I think she and I could have really clicked. I, I, I really feel that through looking at her work and reading about her and reading her writing, what you just said, that positive, that positive spirit. So, um, yeah, Lisa, if you could go ahead and pop up those the, the slides there. The quilt I first thought of that I would love to steal if it weren't a crime from the IQM, Carolyn, had to be barefoot and pregnant. It's so great. Yeah, it's really, really great. And it and it's and we're going to look at a few other quilts of hers that are in your collection there and some that aren't. But I wanted to start with this one because it really epitomizes that comic strip style that she favored, that that she she was able to get a satirical message across, a, sometimes a protest message across in her quilting using this style. And I just wanted to show a few uh, close-ups of it too in a second. But for those who aren't familiar with this quilt and um, you know, the message really says it's for it's, it speaks for itself, except this is an actual quote from an actual speech that a legislator from Arkansas gave in 1963. And it is, uh, she quoted it directly, I'll tell you what we do up here in Perry County when one of our women <laughs> starts poking around in something she doesn't know anything about. We get her a milk, we get her an extra milk cow. If that don't work, we get her a little more garden to tend. And if that's not enough, we get her pregnant and keep her barefoot. And I won't dignify the man by saying his name, but I will show you a few uh, close-ups of those blocks. So, you know, it, it's such a heavy topic. Uh, it's, it was such a offensive speech to make, and yet she puts her spin of humor on it so that she could reach audiences and have them that was her way of getting people to listen to what she had to say. Right. You know, and she's quoted as saying, nobody turns away from comic strip format. Everybody feels I can get this. So they'll read what I have to say and I can comment on things that I think are important to me or are important to people in general. And I think that's really interesting too, that she said important to people in general. She didn't say just to women. I think she saw these women's issues as everyone's issues, right? She was just a pioneer. She was ahead of her time. And, um, you know, she just had a way of being very, I feel like very pointed in her message. But like you said, in a way that you could, you could hear it and you could take it and you wouldn't immediately go on the defensive about it. You would, you would kind of laugh and then you, you'd start to think about it. Exactly. Absolutely. And that takes skill. That takes talent. That's uh, not something everyone's very good at, right? <laughs> no, it's a skill, no doubt. It's definitely a skill. Yeah. And 
this I I would love to come up there sometime and study this quilt a little bit more closely. But uh, you know, for now though, let's let's pull back just a minute because let's look at Jean Ray Laurie herself as as the person and and the other aspects of her career. And I want to start with uh, noting she was born in 1928 in Iowa. She didn't then lived a good part of her life, probably most of her life in California. Mm-hmm. Later, and she did study art and education in Iowa, and then she got her MA in art and design from Stanford University. And that's where she made Tom's quilt. She says it's her; it was her first one, but it was pretty well made. So I don't know, but <laughs> we're going to have to take her on her word. Um, yeah. <laughs> she made Tom's quilt as the project, I think her final project for her master's degree mm-hmm. in 1956. And, you know, this was really one of her signature styles too, was this applique of everyday objects, you know, looking at them in a humorous way. And and I think she named this quilt after her son, who was what, four or five at the time. And uh, sorry, the, the, the pictures are a little bit fuzzy. I tried to pull out a few of the fun motifs in there. You know, you've got a school bus and ice cream cone and a watermelon and all of these. It's it's like a ice an I spy quilt <laughs> in a in yes, a way. It's a right. And what was so really cool about this quilt is it it launched her career. This quilt launched her career. She showed it at the 1958 Eastern States Exposition, which uh, is held in, I think it's called the Big E now, and that's held in Massachusetts. And at that show, Roxa Wright, who was uh, a juror at the show and was also the creative director of House Beautiful Magazine, saw this quilt and invited uh, Jean Ray Laurie to start making uh, designs for their magazines. House Beautiful, Woman's Day, and uh, Better Homes and Gardens. And that really got her into the commercial side of the the quilt and and fiber artist design space. Yeah, and it it really put her out there in front of a lot of eyes too. I mean, it it was hugely impactful. And I think that, um, you know, this was really early she was doing this before anybody else was. And I, it, you just have to think it had a huge impact across the country. Oh yeah. You know, I mean, SACWA, the, um, the art quilting association that didn't come around until I think the late mid or late eighties. Right. Right. And for, and yes, there were quilts made earlier that had these art aspects to them but really she went headlong into it and said quilts are art I'm making art this you know to to be doing this in her master's program in the 50s when there was still the 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 argument about low art women's needlework and and fiber arts and men's art was high art sculpture painting etc and she went all in for it right in her art program not yeah. in, the, in a textile program or a home right. ec program, but in her art program. And and she had made, I, I think you're going to show a couple of other pieces she made during grad school at, at that time. And so she's bringing textiles into it immediately. I think the other thing that strikes me about this quilt is that the shapes are things that you see her repeat throughout her career. It's just certain really kind of um, flat cartoonish, I guess, like you said, cartoonish kind of presentation of these great everyday things. Yes, yes, absolutely. And I'll just show a a few, a selection of of a few of her quilts here. You know, she, she made and made and made and made and wrote and wrote and wrote. I mean, her, her mate, her, the catalog of her work would be massive. So this is just a few. And most of these are in your collection there. But um, yeah, you see that watermelon again, mm-hmm. and and I have another slide of that. And I think this one's clever. I'm gonna pull this one out and expand it just a second, because I love the camels. It's I, it's called uh, uh, Seven Camels Go West, right? Yeah. And then, <laughs> and then do you see the one here? One by himself. 
<laughs> one goes one goes east, <laughs> seven camels go west. I think that says a lot about her humor. She's just kind of quiet about it in a way, right? She was very subtle. And um, I was mentioning um, when we were packing at her house, it was really tough because she would tease my sister and I about the things that we were busy doing. And you didn't really know if she was teasing because she was very kind of <laughs> ironic with it and very funny. And after you kind of got used to it, then, you know, you, you loved it. But yeah, at first she really caught me off guard. Yeah. Oh, by the way, you see her iconic red glasses there. I, mine aren't nearly as cool, but I wore my red ones today in, in her honor. <laughs> nice. And then, you know, as I mentioned, she was a writer as well. And, and she was a really prolific writer. I think she was, she said writing was really important to her. She kept a daily journal. Uh, she was writing craft and sewing books before the how-to books were really a thing. Yes. Uh, and this isn't even all of her books. This is, I think, 21 of her books, but I believe she she published 30, something, give or take, around there. She was a really prolific writer and teacher and then taught with some of those books, too. And, you know, the thing is, these days, for makers today, it's so easy to find a book on any technique that right. you want right. to experiment with. And even if you can't, you know what, I heck, you go on YouTube. That's how I learned how to quilt was YouTube. So there are all of these resources and these how to's out there now. But we're talking about when she started uh, publishing her books, that was in the 60s. 66 was her first early. book. And there really weren't any of those out there. No. And this is what is really cool about the, the collection that she gave us is that a huge part of what we have are her materials that she used for her books. So her teaching samples, her teaching materials, her patterns, bits and pieces of these things that she created. I honestly, she just, we have just the most amazing collection of her, not just her quilts. We have about 40 quilts, but we have um, all of her archival materials. So we were, and, and, she was just so gracious to to really make sure that we got all of those materials and got them housed in a place where they'll be, you know, they'll be around for people to use and enjoy. Absolutely. And I, and I can't wait to, to enjoy them and use them. <laughs> her felt work is so much fun. All, oh, of her, all of her applique stuff. I, I'm really inspired to, to go do some felt work myself now. And I had never thought that I wanted to do that until yeah. I really dug into to learning more about her. Uh, but um, yeah. yeah, so speaking of applique, and again, multiple techniques. So she was like, do whatever technique you need to, to use to make your message in your piece, in your art. And this is applique and embroidery. Very mid-century modern. Very. Here. Uh, 1959. So I think just after uh, grad school for her. And then you guys also have these two. So she ended up making a series out of it, which is so interesting. And, you know, I, I love too that she talks about in her books, and I think in, in her, when she was teaching too, she was all about empowering other women to tap into that creative force inside of them. And she was, she said over and over, that I'm not making complicated quilts. I'm not even really that great of a quilter, she'd say. But, you know, so she said, just try it. Just start. And it, you just even start with simple shapes and simple stitching. And it, it doesn't have to be elaborate to be right. art. Yeah, she. I, I love that she just had that attitude. Like, you know, you can do it. You can do yeah. whatever you need to, whatever you want to. We can do it all. And just, yes. just keep working at it. Just keep working at it. And so here's that book that I mentioned, her first book in 1966. And, and I regret that I don't have this in my library yet. I, I will. I will have this one at some point. <laughs> but I, I thought, thought it was really funny. I heard her in an interview as I was researching it. She said, I can't basically, I can't believe they let me write that because what did, what did I know at that time? 66, wow. Yeah. It's a beautiful cover. I was just going to say, the cover almost looks kind of modern, doesn't it? Very modern, yeah. You wouldn't put it in the 60s. I mean, she just had such a unique viewpoint and a an, uh, creative energy about her. Just, she yeah. just was so productive. It was amazing. I loved it. Love it. 
And two, I think it's important that we put her and her work into context with the social environment and the change that was happening for women in the 60s and 70s, right? Because in her in her work and in her her teaching, she was really oh, Julie's gonna have give me a copy of it. Yeah, Julie. Right. <laughs> okay. ah. uh, yeah, so she, she was a homemaker and a mother and a wife and also an artist. So her audience really was that um, segment of the female population that was trying to balance all of those things. And what's really important for us to, to remember when we look back on that is, you know, I'm coming up on 50 years old and my generation, I think, is sometimes out of touch with and unappreciative of exactly how challenging it was for the women who came before us. And, you know, when the My Mary Tyler Moore show came out in 1970, that was it was radical for a single woman with a professional career to turn down a marriage proposal. <laughs> it was, you know, and continue on her professional career in, you know, it, until 1974, it was not illegal to turn down a woman for credit if she was not having her husband co-sign with her. And until ni until 1978, you could be fired for becoming pregnant. So, you know, it's, can you imagine? <laughs> no, I, it, it's just it's strange to think about. That's very much in my life uh, my lifetime. I'm you know being young, being aware of that, and watching a lot of the um, the protests that went on in the 70s and the the crazy things that would go on in, in bigger cities. I was here in Nebraska, but. Um, seeing it on the news and seeing a lot of that on the news was really crazy. Um, but it is also something that I, I love because I was really interested in these seventies artists like Miriam Shapiro and Faith Ringgold and Judy Chicago. And the fact that somehow they were breaking through yeah. and having this success in the seventies. And, and actually I think it was a really interesting period where a lot of people were able to, to find some success. And I think we, we kind of backtracked after the seventies in a way over the next couple of decades, because so much was going on with textiles, particularly in the seventies. And, and I think you and I both did a lot of research on that because we just looked at the abstract design in American quilts show that was held in New York in 1971. And it really makes you realize what an incredible decade the 70s was and so much was happening at that time extraordinary time an extraordinary time uh and i you know i i was around but i was very young for it so <laughs> i have to live through it live it through uh, research and study um and so and, and another thing really quickly before we move on from this slide is a lot more women in the 60s and 70s were entering uh, higher education, institutions of higher education. I think she, for her to get her master's degree in the 50s, first yeah. of all, that alone was you know, not the norm. No. <laughs> not at all the norm. Uh, and more and more women, now, okay, first of all, let's just be real here. Women have always been working outside the home. That's not new, right? right. So, but more and more women were working outside the home and staying in the workplace outside the home after marriage and after children. So that was part of what was really becoming what was the new thing then. And then how do you balance all of those things, right? Uh, let's see, Kathy says, I remember all that discrimination in the early 70s when I started my sales career. Yeah, Kathy was a big salesperson. You have to make, you had to make a choice between being a mother or a career woman. Yeah, I think that's really very it was probably really? very true yeah. most of the time like you had a lot of pressure to feel that way to feel that it wasn't you know like you weren't taking care of your family if you were a working woman right you couldn't do it all yeah and, and then, there were women that really were out there saying no you know you can do it and mm -hmm. thank goodness well a lot of companies weren't as uh aware <laughs> You know, I work right. for a company now that's that works really well with with mothers and and fathers, working parents, right? But at that time, you were expected to 
you know, it was the man's game and you were expected to be there all the time and, and do the dinners and do the golfing and all of this. And it wasn't, yes, you can leave at three 30 to pick your kids up from school. No, <laughs> you would have to forego the promotion yes. for that. And still sometimes you have to do that today, but so there's a little context for us, but we, and we could go down that rabbit hole, couldn't we? But we'll, let's, let's move back to the quilts if we could. <laughs> Good idea. <laughs> yeah. So uh, her book, Quilts and Coverlets, A Contemporary Approach. This is um, a fantastic book. The, again, she went into, this is a simple shape and you can do this, this, and this, and, and don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to try this applique or this new stitch or you know making little miniature puff quilts and sewing them together and again none of this is super complicated but also it was it was really new to have these sorts of how-to books like this and there's another child's quilt with those motifs you said that you know, she used throughout her career all the apple and the fruit and the whale and the flowers. And, and I think they're really sweet. I really want to make one, but there's so many things to make in so little time. <laughs> it's true. It's yeah, true. She, she is inspiring. I mean, you look and you think it really is. It's simple, but it's deceptively simple. I think I think she had a, a, a you know, just a feel for it. Um, oh, sure. Yeah, it's inspiring. I mean, because obviously she a lot of people, you know, followed her and made quilts. And so she really did have that impact. And so they I do think they have that yeah. simplicity about them that makes that doesn't make you like feel like you couldn't do it. Right. And and like you said, I mean, it's clearly she has an artistic eye for it and not everyone could pull it off in just this way. But the fact that she was encouraging women in that way and saying, you can do this. This is this is attainable for you. A lot of uh, women, especially that generation in that space at that time, really needed that extra um extra encouragement, right? I mean, you didn't have Instagram and Facebook and social media and all of this stuff saying, yes, you can do this, you can do this, you can do this. This was, you could feel really isolated being at home raising your children. And, you know, these books and, and going to a, a, a workshop with her could spark that in you. And, and I, I've read that she changed many women's lives with that. So yes, she did. And I love too that again, she she does not look at quilts versus art. It's quilts are art to her. And as we as is very obvious by her doing her master's uh, project as a quilt, but she says in this book, women have always combined art with sewing in the tradition of quilt making. And I love that she really furthered that idea. She stayed true to that also. And this is something, when I read this, it, it really kind of blew my mind because I've been saying this in my lectures to guilds for several years now, is that quilts were, and I mean, I haven't quoted her on it, but this is very much what I have said, is quilts are made not only as utilitarian pieces, but also because they offered women a medium of self-expression. And then my emphasis here, making it bold because it's so important, it was the desire to add beauty to everyday articles of the home that led to the use of carefully arranged and selected mosaics of colored fabric. Because you might have to make something because you have no other way of keeping your family warm. You may live in scarcity, right? right. And you may have very few resources at your disposal and even few scraps but when you have those, that palette, however scarce it is and however limited it is, and you have to make something, the rest of your world may be pretty grim, but you can make that one thing beautiful, right? It's true. And and we just see evidence of it always. And, and that's what I really love about Jean is that she just, she didn't quibble over that. It was, it was like such a matter of fact thing in everything she produced. It was like, this is just what it is. This is what you're doing. You're making these choices, these artistic choices. And um, I, yeah. I just love that she she just, again, she didn't make it like a big, you know, she wasn't out there beating people over the head with it, but she was very clear that yeah. that's how she felt. And, and yeah. she made work that supported it. And we're going to see a couple other pieces that I just think are so fabulous. So she, 
she's just amazing. I, oh, I really wish I'd known her. I, I'm going to have to get together and sit down with some of my friends who did know her, including you, and uh, learn some more personal stories. And this, this, this book was the first one of hers that I laid my hands on. And uh, so happy that I have a copy of this one. The Creative Woman's Getting It All Together at Home Handbook. Now, let's quickly look at that list because that list has not changed. For women today, these are still the things that working mothers are grappling with. I mean, finding space and on being superwoman and the playpen in the studio and <laughs> shifting gears. I mean, all of that stuff is still relevant to today's woman just as much as it was relevant then. And, uh, I, I, you know, again, she was speaking to an audience that was that was familiar to her. And one of the reasons I think that she was so successful in empowering women with her message and her philosophy was that they saw that she was doing it. Right. Yeah. This was her life. And I love this quote from that book. The essential thing is determining what is important. And I've pulled these three sentences out so that we can see them really clearly, because to me, those are so critical to this, is what do you really want to do? Who are you? And what do you want to be? Now, again, this book was published in 77, and even in 77, that wasn't a question women were asked a lot. You know, you didn't, you didn't say to a young woman very often, okay, it wasn't the norm in most areas, in most circles, that, what do you want to be? Right. It was kind of assumed that you would be a wife and a mother and a housekeeper and, and nothing against those choices at all. But to, for it to be assumed for you is a whole nother thing. Right. But she's saying well, here, you, yeah. you get to choose who you are. Well, you know, that was that was um, when I was 77. I was a junior in high school and thinking about what I was going to do. And even then, even though I had that freedom to know I was going to go to college, you still kind of had certain careers that were that you were kind of more st steered towards. You know, there weren't women in engineering. There weren't women who were trying to go to space. I mean, there was it was still really limited as much as I think the 70s really kind of broke a lot of those boundaries. There were still so many expectations that seem probably really foreign to young people today. Yeah. But it, it, it's been a while now. It's been a while. And this oh, so great. <laughs> this is I the love best this. It's the best picture. That is about what my sink looks like uh, at times. Yeah. I'm so busy working. Um, <laughs> but I did marry a man who does dishes, so that's a plus. Uh, <laughs> this photo is on the back of that book that we just were talking about. And, and it really illustrates everything about that book. Like, yes, she's just made a fresh loaf of bread, but the dishes can wait because she's got to put edits in her book, right? <laughs> the work her, daughter, um, her daughter Liz was there when we were visiting with Jean and um, just lived up the, the hill from her. And she said, this is exactly what it looked like in their house. This is just what it was, is there's all of these things going on all the time. And, um, but Jean just didn't really get too head up about the mess. She just yeah. didn't really worry about that. It was just, it was just as important to be creative and to produce and be an artist as it was to, to work around the house. And, and, you know, for some of us, I I'm saying us because that's, a, that's hard for me to say, Oh, I can't do that right now. You know, I, I was raised in a very tidy home and you did the dishes and you kept back and everything was very clean. And, so it's, it's difficult for me to go, oh, but I'm, I'm learning. I'm learning. And, and getting to know Jean through these ways is, is helping me <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Uh, Julie says her studio later was her living room, the entire living room. <laughs> yeah. I have when I first started sewing, uh, I was making quilts as prolifically or as much as I do. And I started on the kitchen table and the kitchen island was my cutting table. So whenever we'd have to, whenever we had anybody over, I had to haul everything out and pack it up, bring yeah. it back. Yeah. I'm familiar with that for sure. 
Yeah. You know, that's just it. You just got it. You know, Jean is just so inspiring because she really did feel like you could do all of it. You could do yeah. it and make your priorities. And, and But sometimes you just had to put yourself first. And yes. I think that's something that people are not very good at doing. Um, and she just felt like it was like, it was like something your soul needed, like nourishment, just like food that you really needed to do that. Yeah. I think you've hit the nail on the head there is you had, it's, it was a choice. You have to, to do that for yourself. You know, nobody's going to give you that time. Nobody's going to come and wave wet magic wand and say, oh, I relieve you of all of these duties and obligations. Darn it. No, I know. Right. But, um, and I, you know, speaking of, of housewife free, <laughs> <laughs> is oh, this these a, are so fun. A fabulous series, right? I mean, just look at the way she creates these figures, because I mean, like you said, you know, anybody could do these, these, there are simple shapes, they're simple forms. These are some of her felted pieces, I believe, but they move, they have energy. They, they just are so expressive. I just love what she does. And she did this amazing, like a lot of her felt work is just this layering and layering and layering of color. It, it, they are just so fun, but they're really intricate. And it's not something you could just, you know, whip out in a couple of hours. There, there's a lot to them. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot going on in them. And and although they're they're fun and comical, they're also subversive. It's a it's it's a, it's saying, hey, I'm I'm a, I am an angel. I'm a superwoman to do all of these things. You know, it's is it's glorifying and and giving value to, or I shouldn't say giving value to, recognizing the value of the contribution that is housework and home, right? Right. And I was fascinated when I came across this. Oh, sorry. I double clicked the wrong thing. I got so excited. <laughs> <laughs> Take a look at the similarities between that series, The Housewife's Fantasy and or Fantasies, and this cover of Ms. In, from 1972. So that's Isn't that the that's a handy goddess with her arms and she's juggling all of those responsibilities plus her creative outlet. I'm thinking with that typewriter, right? Yeah. And she's juggling time and the ironing and the egg in the skillet. And it's not a far leap from goddess to angel or angel to goddess, right? right. And her characters were angels in, in there. And then she had that one with the egg, the eggs in the skillet, <laughs> just like the skillet with the eggs on the Miz cover. So, you know, I don't know. Did, did she, was she influenced by that cover at some point? I don't know. I think there was just a lot of debate about how you do this. Can we do this? Uh, people saying, no, you're selfish for wanting to do this and wanting yeah. to have your own life. And I think it was just this constant you know, give and pull and back and forth about like, what, what should a woman do and how should she do it? And how should, you know, and, and to not focus on your family with that, like a hundred percent attention was kind of like, well, that, I think it was scary to people. Like that's what women do. And when you break out of that, then we don't know what you're going to do. So, right. Uh, you could be ostracized from the community. Yes. I, th I think my mom was exactly this way. You know, and, um, when I was probably, uh, probably 1970 or so, my mom went to work. She said, you know, the kids are all grown. My sister started kindergarten. She went to work and she was a frustrated housewife. And so she just lived this whole thing. Once she got out of the house and got a job, she was just so much happier. She started doing her art classes. She started really expanding her life in a significant way. And she had been really held down by the expectations of family. And of course there were eight children in her family. So yes, um, she was, it was, I think there were for a lot of women, it was really tough to yeah. try to be that superwoman at home and not have anything for yourself. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. 
And I, I love that she was recognized early on as a significant contributor to uh, our world of quilting and the legacy of quilts. Um, even though she wasn't following traditional patterns and, and really was opposed to following traditional patterns in her work for the, for the most part, you know, she wanted that original creative uh, outlet. But I love that she was uh, in, inducted rather into the Quilters Hall of Fame in 1982. And then she had a series of essays or columns uh, really themed keeping it all together as a riff, I guess, on the getting it all together handbook, right? And this was in Quilters Newsletter Magazine from 82 to 84. And I love that it's keep playing, keep working, keep asking, you know, again, she's saying, yes, you can do it. Come on. It, it, I, I feel like that was, that's one of the largest parts of her legacy is how she was able to just keep saying, yes, you can come on, come on, <laughs> gathering all the women I together. To, to do yeah, I, I didn't even realize she had so many articles and, um, columns in Quilter's newsletter. I mean, she really was a voice that everyone was listening to and paying attention to. I mean, everybody was reading yeah. Quilter's newsletter magazine because it was yeah. one of the few magazines on quilting that was out. And um, so she was, I mean, she had to have an incredible impact on quilt making and people oh, who, yeah. who really just dove into it. Absolutely. Extraordinary impact. I mean, she's reaching the everyday quilter, the everyday woman and, and, you know, rural America with her magazine articles, you know, you, that's, that's a pretty wide net. <laughs> and I absolutely love this quote. I use it in one of my other lectures. I, I really feel like Jean Ray Laurie might, might be my spirit animal. Um, I love this. She says, if you're asking me to offer any advice, it would be to risk everything all the time and to quit trying to be safe. Once you're willing to risk your whole reputation on something, then you can leap forward. And that just, doesn't that just fills me with all of this excitement? It's <laughs> inspiring. It really I does know. make you want to just, just jump in and, and create and, and do your thing. And you're right. I think yeah. she, she just encouraged me. That's what people said all the time. Um, after she died, there were so many people that talked so much about how they she had influenced their lives. So Absolutely. I think she really she just had an incredible impact. And and then she had this other series of columns too, also in Quilter's newsletter of talking it over and giving advice on on various aspects of quilting and quilt life and entering your work in shows and what have you. And I this one struck me pretty closely when it, she'd have a talking it over and it'd be about X, Y, or Z. And this one's about talent. And I'm convinced that everyone was given the potential to be creative. So she's back there to, you know, again, with this encouragement and this empowerment, empowerment of, yes, you have it in you. <laughs> Don't listen to that little voice. Just do it. <laughs> oh, it's such a great piece. So oh. wickedly funny. So wickedly funny. Wickedly funny. W sharp. Oh my gosh. She was she was very witty. So witty. So she saw this written, this quote is something she saw written in a guest book at a, a gallery showing of contemporary paintings. So you can imagine, you know, big splashes of color, block, that sort of thing. And the quote was, these is not art to me, all these squares and things. Real art has, you know, like a Madonna in it. So <laughs> she puts the quote around the center of this quilt. And then she slaps a Madonna in the center. Just <laughs> <laughs> no. And she stamped it on. Like, here's your Madonna. I've got your Madonna. I'll give you a Madonna. <laughs> I'll give you a Madonna. There you go. And it makes me laugh every time. <laughs> it is great. And I love the way she used text on her pieces because she, oh, yeah. you know, she really has a strong viewpoint she's, she's putting across and a strong statement to make. And, uh, and she does it in a really provocative way. 
She really does. But again, but not with a hammer. You know, yeah. so she wants you to to absorb it. She wants you to sit with it and think about it and not just feel beaten with it, which resonates with me a great deal. Well, and with, I love that piece because it also has that that kind of square in a square. So she's make it looks almost like an Amish quilt form. She's using a really traditional form. So it's it adds kind of another whole layer of that subversive quality to it because she's saying, you know, this is quilts and this is still art. So yeah, I love her. Yeah. I hadn't noticed that. I'm that was a really, I hadn't either until I sat here and kind of looked at it. I'm like, hey, <laughs> it's like a big old Amish quilt. So she's just so creative. She's so creative. And uh, I know Julie also you're out, if you're still out there, you, I know were instrumental in, uh, putting this together to the California State Quilt Project. And uh, Jean Ray Laurie wrote the preface for this and about how uh, quilts are archetypal symbols of women who make them. And and I won't continue reading this to you. I think I've done enough reading to you today. But, uh, you know, it's it's so important to to recognize how the maker puts so much of themselves in that. And even if you don't know who made it, even if it's an anonymous or unknown maker, you can still feel that person's spirit. And, and you know, we can kind of surmise what she might've been thinking or feeling and who knows if we're right or not. But, we, you know, a lot of times you can hold a piece and really feel something by it. You know, Carolyn, it just dawned on me, Carolyn, you and I were talking when I was up there last summer with the abstract design and American quilts exhibit that you had there and how we felt like the spirit of those women were in the room with oh, us. Yeah. I, I do think that their quilts show their spirit. I mean, there are fabric choices. There are ways you put things together. There are the colors you took. I mean, it's, you do get a sense of those makers. And I love this quote because I think she says it in just such a beautiful way. Yeah her spirit, energy, vitality, and skill, the essence. I love that. The essence of the quilter. That's really so true. Yes. And I know we're, we're uh, coming up on our time here. I want to make enough room, leave enough room for uh, questions and comments if we have them, but I first want to move on and, and show this quilt too. I'm going to skip <laughs> over the one of the others. <laughs> <laughs> you just crack me up. She, they are just so subtle. And then you read them and you're just thrown off by it. <laughs> I mean, it's really a, a protest against the, the body image that we get beaten over the head with, that we have to be these super thin and, and body dysmorphic ideas about, oh, I have a protruding stomach or big arms or, I mean, because look at this. These are, I, I think she, she, she at least took inspiration from, if not nearly copied, some dress pattern illustrations for this, mm -hmm. right? And yeah, yeah. one of them says, altering sleeves for an arm that is somewhat fuller than average. And then look at the drawing. That's what <laughs> <laughs> And uh, altering so and, and cutting a skirt for a protruding abdomen. I mean, come on. <laughs> oh. That is... A protest against fashion and that industry trying to make us feel lesser than, I think. Yeah, and she just must have seen things in such a unique way because she would just pick out these things that just, and some of them were very obvious, obviously, but just she just questioned things with that sense of humor of hers. Really yeah. makes you think. It's just great. Yeah. And I can go back to some of these other things too, if we want to, but uh, so that we have time for some questions or comments, I wanted to just mention that I, I've said, I wish I could have known her, but I wasn't, I didn't start quilting until after she passed. And I love that she wrote her own obituary and she said, don't mourn for me because I've had a long and happy life, a wonderful family and an exciting and satisfying career. I love that she put satisfying in there as well. So. Yeah, what an amazing, she's just a pioneer, a, a, a real pioneer in the quilt world and um, in the textile world and the art world. She just did a lot for a lot, a whole generation of us, I think. 
And, you know, we didn't even touch on, she in the early 2000s designed fabric for Free Spirit Fabrics. She was a designer for Clovis Needlework. I mean, mm -hmm. she did <laughs> a whole body of work out there that-, that Yeah, and I think, I think in this photo, she's standing in, couple, uh, in front of a couple of really, really oversized panels that she made for an organization in her hometown there. Um, for kind of like a, that had a nature focus. So you can see one is all birds, one is flowers. I think they were just enormous um, panels that she made. And, and she was just so lovely. I told her um, I was really inspired when we were at her home and we saw a lot of her woodworking because my mother had gotten into woodworking and had gotten a, a bandsaw for the basement. And it was fascinating because my mom started out making like strange garden animals and covering them in fur for the backyard, which we all kind of were a little alarmed by. But then she, she grew and she started following patterns and she got better and better. And then she made beautiful clocks and pieces for us. So Jean, actually, before I left, my my sister and I were there, obviously. Um, she got one of her woodworking books out and signed it for my mom and gave it to me to take home to my mom for some inspiration, which I just thought was so amazing. And oh, wow. she was just just the loveliest person. Oh. And I obviously Julie's on saying she misses her and she was really one of a kind. Um, we do. We need to get some more people on talking about her and get some of these memories kind of in a way that we can all share them and enjoy them because she was so special. She really was. I, 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 I am feeling that. And I loved, I just popped this comment in from Julie. Her shape is the same as the quilt behind you. And I actually, I selected this quilt specifically for this talk because I call this quilt, I'll do it how I damn well please. <laughs> which is exactly in the spirit of Jean Ray Laurie. And uh, Julie, if you, you probably recognize this, I bought this from you. <laughs> I bought this from Julie a couple of years ago. And it, it's, it's so unusual, such a great piece. And, yeah. and the freedom that it has in it is I think something that Jean would have loved because, you know, it was like, just do it. Just get busy and do it. And I love, I, I'm really going to think a lot about that quote of hers. Don't, you know, don't be afraid to take risks. Just jump in because that yeah. is where you find your joy and your creativity. Absolutely. Yeah. Let's see, we have a few minutes and I, uh, I'd i love to show another one. Uh, Lisa says she had a chance to meet Jean and tell her what, oh, See, I just keep hearing that about her. I'm, I'm just going to have to find her in the spirit world when, <laughs> when I go. I'm going to, I'll put you together with her daughter because I think you'd see a lot of that beautiful, generous spirit in her daughter um, as well. So, oh, but I, I think I, we really will. We, do, we need to do another program and we need to just have a bunch of people share some memories of Jean and, and get it taped. And um, maybe we can find some more photos and, um, just really look at her and her life would be really a great program and a great thing to archive. Absolutely. Yeah. Mid, mid oh century shape of that mid modern. Oh, the mid century. Yes. Yes. The circle, the, um, yeah, I think so. Julie was just mentioning something about in the comments about, I think back to this quilt and, um, it's, it's a Joseph's, a Joseph's coat pattern and applique, which was typically a pieced pattern. But this woman really said, forget about that and forget about the plain muslin background. I'm, I'm putting this on whatever. The pods, she says, yeah, let's go back to those pods. Let's go like back them. to those pods. Aren't they fabulous? Yeah, I think the um, second slide you showed, the, those are a relatively new um, gift to the collection that was um, a good friend of Jean's daughter, I believe. So, so there's some kind of family co um, connection and we were able to get a few more additional pieces. And so these, I think, are just, it's so intriguing. I, I It's so such a, a simplified, very artistic approach mm -hmm. to these. But yeah, you can kind of see her other work in it too with the colors. Yeah. Obviously they're, they're embroidered around them. I kind of like the way her circle's not perfect. You know, oh. she doesn't get head up about those kind of things, I don't think. Right. Yeah, I think you're right. 
It's a little difficult to see. It looks like, but definitely embroidery there. Hand stitches around. Yeah. So Julie says, go back to. Go back to. slides, Julie. This Look one? That one. That one definitely <laughs> looks like your quilt. Um, that's the books. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I think this is the one she was talking about. I think so. Yeah. And here's one we didn't talk. One more, she says. One more. <laughs> to the books, Julie? <laughs> or this? This one? Maybe that one. With the camel. <laughs> I love yeah, that. Yeah, that was her desk. And Julie was saying her... Um, her workroom was her living room. That was her desk in her living room. So she was, she was right in the middle of the house. The biggest area of the house became her studio. I remember her talking about that. I know a lot of makers who've done that. Just they've moved the, the family room or the den off into a, one of the bedrooms and taken over the larger room. The piece, I, I don't know which one she's talking about, but. Um, peace sign like. I don't know which one she's talking about. I don't know either. But since we have another minute, let me show you this one that we didn't get to talk about. I love this one is so <laughs> funny. Look at that woman roll her eyes. I love that so much. <laughs> Nervous. Yes. Right That's really what these advertisements in the early 20th century were like. It was drawings or photos of a woman saying this this tonic or this potion has relieved female my troubles. nervousness, my nervous fits, <laughs> my female troubles. She asked why men get shop space, but women often do not. Mm. So she took over the best room in the house because she was going to have her uh, space. Yep. Yep. Have space to work. Get some space. That's right. That was a big deal for her is to have your own studio space. Yeah. Yeah. Your own, you carve out your own space. Really space. Yep. Very reminiscent of Vic, um, Virginia Woolf in a room of her one's own. Yes. Well, um, we do have an. A, if you wanted to see a little bit more, first of all, you can go see Jean Marie Laurie's pieces on our um, online database. I'd suggest using the quote maker field and just put in her last name L A U R Y. And that'll bring up everything that's on the online database. And then um, I think we had a 2012 exhibition. So if you went into our past exhibitions, um, Tara's pulled up some photos here. So we did a, an exhibition of a number of the pieces um, that we got in the new collection. So um, yeah, I'm going to pull that reasons. up here. I opened the web page. Yeah, and I think Nancy Bavor talks a lot about Jean in her um, master's thesis on the California movement as well. So I'm yes. sure there's a way to get to Nancy Bavor's research as well. Yeah, getting it all together. Yes, there is. In fact, I am glad you mentioned Nancy because she has a clip here. Oh, I didn't even realize we had Nancy talk. Um, we've got her lecture there. Great. Yeah, so that's under featured media for anyone who wants to go find that. Nancy did her master's um, work on Jean Ray Laurie. She did in the program there at Nebraska. And I love that title, Threads of Feminism. Yeah. It's a really good talk. You'll really enjoy that. So that was about 2012. Um, you'll have to just kind of page back. Our exhibitions are in reverse order under past exhibitions on our website. And that's just internationalquotemuseum.org. So, yeah. Right here. And you can always send a message. If you can't track it down, we can help you find it easy enough. Absolutely. And we can put it in the show notes on YouTube too. Yeah, that's a great idea. Well, gosh, everybody, it's that time. We've been here for an hour. Oh, this was so much fun, Tara. Um, as we call her here at the museum, JRL. We love to talk about JRL so much. Yeah. Um, <laughs> She, she's one of our uh, our goats, as they say, greatest of all time. So um, anyway, what a great program. Um, next program we have is in April. Yes. We're going to skip a couple months. 
and then we're going to be talking to Zania Cord. So look for that coming up in April. Do we have one scheduled before? Actually, that? in March we have one with Lisa Evans. Oh, that's right. That's right. Well, good. So we only have one month off, and then yeah. we'll be back with everybody and um, have another opportunity to talk about quilts in the collection. So fantastic. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you Thank so much. You, I always enjoy you. So much fun. And everybody stay warm, stay healthy, and we'll talk to you soon. Okay. Bye. Bye.